Um, actually, probably most researchers in the biology of aging are working on one of these systems across the world. And we love them because they're short-lived. Um, we can do relatively inexpensive research with them, but they don't look a whole lot like people. And one way we get around that in grant applications is to talk about the emergence of a pipeline, a pipeline of interventions in, through screens in these simple organisms into preclinical science in rodents and into clinical science. And I want to talk about that concept and show you at least one example of how we're trying to move our research through this pipeline. But I also want to question the existence of the pipeline and, and, and some of the problems it might have. The particular problem I want to address uh, for most of the talk is the issue of reproducibility. If the pipeline's going to work and we are going to give really great interventions or compounds or other, other interventions to preclinical scientists, we need to know they really work. They need to be reproducible and they need to be re robust. And I would suggest that we maybe have a problem here, especially in the pharmacological interventions in ageing. And I'll start by talking about a paper, one of the first papers published by the Buck Institute, by Simon Melov and I, back in 2000. And this paper showed that small drug-like catalytic molecules could extend lifespan in C. elegans by a dramatic amount. And this received enormous coverage across the world. It was published in Science to great acclaim. Problem, though, arose when David Gems, a good colleague at University College London in the UK, tried to repeat those experiments. And despite many phone calls, he could not repeat those experiments and finally published that these compounds did not extend lifespan in the self-same C. elegans tiny roundworm. So these are the microscopic roundworm C. elegans. This pattern of flashy paper getting a lot of attention, followed by uh, not so much getting attention papers coming out refuting the results, is a pattern that's repeated down the years. Michael Petrachek's beautiful paper showing that antidepressants extend lifespan in C. elegans, followed by Michael Risto in Jena in Germany, showing that actually these molecules don't and may even decrease lifespan. And then most of you, of course, know about sirtuin activators, very esteemed scientists publishing in Nature that these uh, do indeed extend lifespan, esteemed scientists at University College of London again, David Gems and Linda Partridge saying that they do not. So one thing you might conclude from this is that nothing works in Europe. Um, the, the other possible conclusion you could take from this is that we don't really know what we're doing here. Uh, these should be conceptually the simplest experiments in the world. You're taking a Petri dish with some bacteria for food, you're adding C. elegans worms, microscopic worms, and then you're adding a compound to that, and you're just watching them die. Really, really simple experiments. There shouldn't be anything complicated about this. But it's a problem, and it's a problem that the National Institute on Aging has recognised for a number of years now. Uh, they recognised it back in 2004 when they set up the Intervention Testing Programme. And this is a programme that tests pharmacological and other interventions in mice at three different sites across the country in an attempt to find reproducibility, an attempt to find compounds that are, are extending lifespan in mice across different research sites. And in some ways this has been a success with rapamycin, of course, being the, the, big, the big success story of the programme. So back in 2013, we were fortunate enough to be involved in a second programme, the Sinerabditis Intervention Testing Programme. And I'm going to give you some of the early results from this programme. Um, it's really, again, an attempt to find reproducible and re robust interventions. So the sites are the Phillips Lab, Patrick Phillips in Oregon, Monica Driscoll's Lab at Rutgers, and ourselves at the Buck Institute. So we said, OK, we've we got to do what the mouse people did. We've got to standardise our protocols and then try and find uh, chemicals that reproducibly extend lifespan across labs. But there was a, a third aspect to this, and that was robustness. We wanted to find chemicals or other interventions that would extend lifespan across a wide variety of genetic backgrounds. And it so happens, Sinerabditis, the genus Sinerabditis, is an excellent place to do that kind of experiment. Um, that's because there's tremendous genetic diversity in, uh, across this, this genus. Um, as much diversity is between us and the worms, for example. And so we chose a bunch of different strains from three different species of Cynobditis, uh, Briggsia, Tropicalis and Elegans. And these are all wild strains, so these have been sourced mainly by Anne-Marie Felix from all sorts of interesting sites around the world with different ecologies. So this is capturing a lot of diversity in biology. And we set out to establish protocols and, and ask where we were. You know, have we been able to reproducibly um, grow these worms in a lab and age them. And so we started by doing experiments that didn't involve any chemical compounds at all, basically just control experiments. We started with three labs, three species, 22 strains, so a lot of work here, 21,000 worms enrolled in this study. 
And this is what we got. So these are survival curves. These are all the survival curves generated by all the researchers in that, in that first experiment. And they're plotted here, survival against aging days from zero to 50 here. And then we asked, well, of all that huge variation that we see, how much of it is species variation, how much is strain variation, and critically, how much is lab variation? And I'll just cut to the chase on the lab here. If you take all those survival curves and overlay them for labs, there is no difference between the three sites. So through a long standardization process that I won't bore you with, we've been able to establish a protocol where we get identical data across all three labs. There were differences in strains, really big differences, which are interesting, differences in species as well. OK, um, this is hard to see, but I think you'll be able to see what I want to show. As we were doing these experiments, we're interested in variation and sources of variation. And the biggest source was actually between experiments. So you set it up once, you get a result, you set it up again, you get a different result. And this variation between experiments really became apparent when we looked at this particular subset of strains here for Briggsia. So these are all different strains. These are the three research sites, and these are survival curves. And they're all controls. There's no drugs in here. They're all identical experiments. You set it up, you set it up again, you expect to get the same result. But what you can see is that we don't. In fact, there's large variation here. Let's just look at this box here. You set it up one time, you get a short-lived cohort. You set it up next time, you get a long-lived cohort. And the pattern repeats itself across all the labs and across most of the strains. This is bimodal aging. There's something going on here which we are not controlling, despite exhaustive efforts to control every single thing we're doing. But you set up the experiment, and you don't know whether you've got a long-lived cohort or a short-lived cohort of identical animals. Dark matter of aging. No idea what it is. If you've got some ideas, we'd love to hear. Um, but you can imagine now coming into this sort of data and saying, right, I'm going to test a compound. Who knows what's going to happen? Maybe in one mode or the other mode, and that might, that might change the way the compound actually affects the survival. So despite that, we did go ahead and looked at compounds. And we, <laughs> I, I suggest actually you, you go to Mark Lukanik's poster, and Mark will explain why he chose this particular list and the other compounds that we're going to go ahead and test. And also, I want to invite you all to suggest compounds to us, because this program is opening up to the entire community. But I want to show you some aspects of things that we found amongst this, this set of experiments. So here is a compound called thioflavin T. It binds amyloids. We think we know how it works, but there's still some mysteries about it. And this is a compound that displays reproducibility and robustness. So here in a strain here called MY16, an elegant strain, you see all three sites have really nice increases in survival. Really nice. And this is it graphed in a different way here, where if you're above the line, you're a biological replicate that has an increase in lifespan. So that's the, the median difference from controls here. So if you're above the line, increase in lifespan. So this is a very robust effect. Every single biological replicate is extending lifespan. Uh, you look at another strain like HK104. This is a longer-lived strain. This is 60 days out here at the end. And yeah, there's an effect. There's a nice clustering of the data. There's an effect on lifespan. It increases lifespan significantly. But the margin is much smaller. So in the longer-lived strain here, the margin is smaller. But that shows that you can have a compound that is going to robustly and reproducibly increase lifespan across three different research sites. Here's another interesting example, MP1, recently published by Mark as well. Um, and this is, we believe, a caloric restriction mimetic. And it's doing something very interesting. In the elegant strains, for the most part, most of the biological replicates show lifespan extension. But you go to the Briggs-A strains, and particularly the long-lived one here, and look at this. So all three sites, that compound is now shortening lifespan. And we expected this. We expected to find compounds that would work in some genetic backgrounds and not others. But that's kind of interesting, because if this was, was people, we would really want to understand why it is that that drug is harmful in a certain group of people than others. And so we have here the genetic ability to go in and dissect those differences and try and understand those differences in response to a longevity intervention. Um, as I say, go to the poster to look at the data in more detail, but you can see the general pattern here. The elegant strains, which are the first three, are generally quite responsive to a number of different compounds. The briggs A strains are more refractory to most of the compounds. And we do see some interesting things, and just, just I think this is a good example here, where you see a big spread 
In different labs and in different replicates within a lab, you have a, really an unpredictable response. You're either going to lengthen lifespan and shorten lifespan. That particular one I pointed to there, we published that. We published that in Nature, and we are not replicating it in any significant way. So it's interesting stuff. And I should say that these, these experiments were being done at the same time. So while you've got one compound that's behaving very robustly, in the next set of plates in the incubator, you've got a compound that's bouncing all over the place. OK, so we're seeing gene by compound effects. We're seeing robust lifespan extension across large genetic variances for some compounds. And we occasionally see this, what looks like, and we'll find out as we go on, but a sort of hyper variance, a hyper response. And if you think about the examples of the literature I showed you, it kind of explains it in some ways. We're seeing a much larger degree of variance than we ever expected, especially between run to run. We're seeing odd bimodal effects in some strains, and we're seeing effects that really bounce around with some compounds. So if you capture some of the variance in your experiments by, based on the way you're doing it, you could publish that you see a big lifespan extension. That's your flashy nature paper. And then along comes your colleague and is doing it slightly differently, and they get a completely different result because now they're sampling a different part of the variance. So we really need to understand the variance in total and the sources of the variance to have confidence in these early experiments at the beginning of the pipeline. So is there a pipeline for aging interventions? I believe there are. And I'm going to show you this example here of thioflavin T again, the robust uh, uh, responder. Thioflavin T was, was found by Silvestri Alves in the lab to extend lifespan in, in the lab strains before we went into the, the wild strains. And it's one of a series of compounds that we've uh, been testing at the Buck Institute in a, in a mouse functional study. This is a collaboration between many labs that was led by Simon Melov, and this is really Simon's data I'm going to mention today. The critical factor in the study was it was longitudinal, so we enrolled mice and then we tested them for various functions, including cardiovascular functions, bone health, metabolism, and so on, until death. And it was a subset of the, the total number of animals which, was, which were in the study. And there's quite a few things coming out of this study, but I just want to highlight one take home, and that's with bone. Uh, this scan made by Simon here illustrates the skeleton of a live animal. And Simon will dissect out an individual bone like the femur and make a series of measures on it. And what he's been able to show is that mouse bone aging is very similar to human bone aging, and that the thioflavin T intervention, the thioflavin T molecule, is able to retard bone loss in these animals to a very significant degree. And we're very confident in that result. Now, there's also preliminary data from Julie Anderson's lab using the same compound. And she's interested in Parkinson's models. And she's seen protection against dopaminergic neural loss by the same molecule. And this is, I think it's funny, because we did the screening in the invertebrate, and it's protecting against bone loss, so that's interesting. But it also might be predictable where a compound that's really slowing an aging process is affecting different functional domains, brain and bone. So yes, I think there is a pipeline, and I think we'll see more of these kind of studies. I just want to indulge in, in two more examples of compound interventions that we've been using, which also illustrate uh, the utility of the model organisms. And, and this is really reverse engineering by thinking, OK, so there's a series of age-related diseases. Can we model the pathologies of those diseases in a simple animal, do the compound screens in those animals, and get compounds back into the pipeline, coming back towards clinical science? And this has been done over the years, and I just want to mention a couple of examples of compounds that we be believe are enhancing autophagy and rescuing some of these models. So on the left is an alpha-synuclein Parkinson's disease model. On the right, A-beta Alzheimer's disease models. And there are, there's a couple of compounds here. There's only one compound here, but there's two in each of the other graphs. And what you're seeing here is protection against dopaminergic neuronal loss, protection, and you're also seeing increased function with these two compounds. And here you're seeing protection or suppression, I should say, of a paralysis associated with A-beta expression in the worm. And again, with that, you see increased function. So these are two compounds that we believe should go back into the pipeline and start making their way towards the preclinical pre science and who knows, eventually, maybe some clinical study. And the last one I want to mention is vitamin D. And this is where the model organisms are perhaps informing of, or, us on mechanisms and perhaps novel mechanisms associated with something that we already know is involved in human health. So we know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with increased susceptibility to a range of age-related diseases, including neurological disease and cancers. And why is that? There's a 
ton of information on, on vitamin D, but it's not clear why such diverse diseases are essentially, the, the rates are elevated if you're deficient. So we've been doing some work in C. elegans again on vitamin D. And one of the damage, uh, part of the damage that Aubrey described accumulating during aging is the accumulation of damaged proteins. And we showed a number of years ago that in worms, if you grow up populations of worms and you separate the insoluble damaged protein from sol soluble protein, you see something quite interesting, and that is that young animals have very little insoluble protein. Older animals, and these are middle-aged, have a great deal of insoluble protein. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of proteins are falling out of solution in these animals during aging. And for reasons I'm not going to go into, we actually believe that this is important material, this is important stuff, it's enriched for proteins that determine lifespan for a start. If, however, the animals are grown in vitamin D, now, when people started culturing vitamin uh, C elegans and other nematodes in the lab, I guess no one thought to put some vitamin D in the mixture. It, the, the media is completely repeat of vitamin D, but if you put vitamin D back into the diet, you can see there's a major suppression of the accumulation of the in insoluble proteins. So this is suppression of a molecular aging phenotype. And because we think this material is important and the accumulation of this material is important, we predicted that vitamin D would extend lifespan in the worm. And it does, three concentrations here. So this is uh, hopefully coming out soon in cell reports. Um, we believe that it might be important, and, and I think the communications between the, the basic scientists and the preclinical scientists and the clinical scientists are improving all the time. And so we're showing this data, we're showing this potentially novel mechanism to clinical scientists who are getting interested in it. And they're interested in it potentially because of this reason, that deficiency causing a loss in protein homeostasis, an increase in protein damage accumulation, is maybe a facet very similar to accelerated aging. In other words, if you're deficient, the reason that you're susceptible to a, a plethora of age-related diseases is you're aging faster. And restoring vitamin D to normal levels is likely to suppress that. Now, that's a grand hypothesis made by a worm people uh, in the face of a vast amount of clinical research on vitamin D. But, it, but it's garnering interest, and I think that this is the way that we can go up and down this pipeline to, to maximize our ability to find excellent, excellent interventions with a, a, a high cloud of information around them to present to the clinical scientists. With that, I just want to thank all the meticulous work done in the lab and the CITP. I think I mentioned most of the people go as, on the slides as we went along. Uh, this is the entire author list across the three CITP sites. Uh, a lot of people involved in these studies. And these are our funders and collaborators. Thank you.